Hi, everyone, and welcome to the DevSecOps track. My name is Lars de Fever, and I'm a volunteer in the OWASP community, and I'll be moderating this session. So during the next 45 minutes, we'll hear John DeLeo and Seba de Leersneder uh, talk about the OWASP SAM project. Um, so please submit any questions you have during this session in the Q&A tab, and I'll be asking our speakers your questions in the last 10 minutes. So let me introduce John and Seba. John is the New Zealand OWASP chapter lead and is on the core team of the OWASP SAM project. He's currently leading the software assurance advisory practice at Datacom New Zealand. Seba is the co-founder and CTO of Torion. Uh, he started the OWASP Belgian chapter and was a member of the OWASP Foundation Board. He's also one of the uh, co-leaders of the SAM projects. And now he's adopting application security models to the evolving fields of DevOps and is also focused on bringing threat modeling to the wider audience. And with that, I'll hand over the world, the, the world, the world, the world to John and Siba. Take it away, guys. Thank you, Lars. Hi, John. All right. So uh, thank you. Uh, thank you all for joining, uh, joining this track. We'll, uh, we'll be uh, uh, talking about an hour and demoing uh, the some project and um, as Lars said don't be afraid to uh, to put your questions in the chat uh, or on the WOVA uh, I would say application uh, we'll leave uh, enough room and we'll, uh, we'll take about uh, 40 minutes or so to present uh, the project and demo the project and we'll leave enough room for Q&A so with that I'll be sharing my screen if everything goes fine, you should be able to see a presentation, which I'm going to start right now. So we're um, going to um, present to you the, the project called OWASP SUM. Uh, now, um, John was already presented, hi John, uh, and myself. Uh, so um, our contact details are also on the last slide. So if you want to reach out to John or myself, don't uh, don't hesitate to do that. But we're here for uh, uh, for some. So what is some actually? Some some is uh, what's called the software assurance maturity model. So it's a maturity model that really provides a effective and above all measurable way for all types of organizations to not only analyze where you are in terms of software security practices, but also to improve that. Uh, and that's really where some shines. Uh, it makes what you're doing in your AppSec uh, pipelines, in your CI CD pipelines measurable. Uh, it makes it actionable. It really provides you with a lot of uh, pointers to what you can do. Um, and also understand that some itself is, is versatile and, and like technology process or organization agnostic. So you can obviously apply this on a, on a DevOps uh, practice, but even for waterfall or agile or other ways of programming, some is definitely something you can uh, and should use uh, as I would say the open source uh, secure development lifecycle framework. Um, everything we show here and also show uh, that afterwards is also available on our website, OWASPSUM.org. Um, anything uh, to add to that, John? No, I, well, I think you did mention about how it's, it's most beneficial as a tool for figuring out how you're going to improve your posture. Um, one of the things I find we often have to help people understand is that you go through a SAM assessment not to obtain some objective score, get a stamp of approval, hang something on the wall. It's really to understand where you are now. And you understand where you are now so you can decide where you'd like to be in six months, in 12 months. And that's really what's important and how the SAM framework is most valuable. Yeah, exactly. Thanks for, thanks for adding that. Um, now, why do we need such a thing as some? Uh, and you're all joining the, the, I would say, the OWASP, uh, I would say, conference. So you're aware of, of uh, adding security activities to a security development lifecycle. But it's really about, okay, how do we do that? How do we 
when we look at designing, building, testing, and, and deploying software in a, in a production environment, how can we add more proactive security controls to, the, to those pipelines or your process? Uh, where uh, certainly I would say the less mature or people who are just starting with security start with like with pen testing or scanning their codes uh, and then patching that. A more proactive way is looking, okay, how, what kind of requirements do I need to uh, address uh, or include in my user stories or my next release? What kind of threat modeling should I do? Coding guidelines and so on. So there's lots of activities that you can add and should add really as part of your development, especially also with DevOps, as that's much quicker in terms of like timing and frequency than the more traditional way of programming it's really crucial to embed those uh, activities, those security activities as part of the development process. Well, that's, that's the whole background of why we need uh, a more structured way of deciding, okay, what kind of activities do we need to add and where do we add them? In what kind of order do we need to add them? Where are we really in terms of like uh, security activities? Um, and that's where, uh, where some comes into place and into play. And it's a maturity model. Um, and why is it a maturity model? So uh, actually, there's a couple of aspects that we need to take into account. Um, when you start adding security activities to a security development or to a development life cycle, any life cycle, um, it introduces change. You're going to change a little bit how you're going to work within your DevOps team or development team or your squad or whatever um, scope that you're working on. And so change is something that you don't do overnight. So you need to have like an iterative way of changing the way that you're working. You're not going to do everything different from one day to the other. Also, you need to understand that when you look at some uh, later on, there's lots of stuff that you can do. Um, and there's, I would say there's guidance, especially also on the website, but there is no single way of doing this. Uh, so there is not like you need to do this first then that and then to, so there's, there's different uh, ways to leading you to the maturity level that you need to get to or want to get to. Uh, and what's key there is that, and that's something that's built into the, the model is that it should be risk-based. So based on your software risk profile, your risk appetite, you should look at, okay, what's enough in terms of activities for us as a team or as, as an organization. And also there's, uh, you need to understand uh, not only yourself as, as I would say, as a, as a developer in the team, but also as a product owner or as a stakeholder or as a business analyst, okay, what do we need? What are we adding here especially? And there, in this case, the framework, the SUM framework provides enough information to actually describe what kind of activities that you can or should be adding. And what makes SUM especially interesting as a maturity model is that it's, it makes your activities, what you're going to add measurable in terms of maturity. And, and then it's really about like, if you can measure it, you can manage it. Uh, and that's where, where SUM helps you to measure where you are and help you to create a roadmap and to also to demonstrate that you're improving the way of, uh, of, of working. Uh, and that, that's a key aspect to that. Anything, uh, anything there, John, that from your side, just chip in. <laughs> we actually, we had the SAM community call, what was this morning for me last night um, in Europe and the question was asked, okay, we did a baseline assessment. What, what does Sam tell us to work on next? And it all comes back to that second bullet. It depends. Um, what does your organization perceive as your biggest areas of risk? What are those areas that your, your C-suite, that your board are most concerned about seeing improvement in? Um, because they'll drive your priorities. And ultimately, as, as was pointed out by one of the participants this morning, all of this is about driving down risk. So you're going to use SAM as a framework to help you understand where you have gaps and then look at how closing those gaps can help improve your risk posture. So there is no one answer. It's very much... Um, based on what's going on in your organization, your industry. 
Neat. All right. So a little bit of background history. Uh, so where, where we came from. So originally, uh, some started as Open Sun was created by a very smart guy, Praveer Chandra, uh, about like already 13 years ago, uh, donated by him uh, and at the time then called Fortify uh, to OWASP Foundation. Um, and then uh, within OWASP, we, we took that over and we started to work on the project itself and improving it. And hence the, the name change, it's now really called OWASP Sum. We've added uh, a couple of like uh, with, uh, updates version 1.1. We did some drastic changes in the way of scoring, which resulted in version 1.5. And then we did a complete revamp uh, of the sum uh, structure and framework uh, towards 2.0, which we're working on since uh, 2020. Now, how does it look like? So we've organized all the different activities in security practices that are really grouped in what we call business functions. And business functions are how do you organize the different security activities as part of a governance business function? How do you add design activities? How do you add implementation activities? Verification, obviously, you want to have a lot of uh, test and ver verification in there. And obviously also how do you operate your software and the security activities in there. So there's five, what we call business functions. And in each of these business functions, you have three security practices. And so for instance, uh, strategy and metrics is something that belongs in governance or for instance, uh, requirements or security testing is something that, that fits into the verification uh, business function. And so in total, we have 15 security practices and each of these security practices are made, uh, there's uh, security activities in there that we, and that you can and should, uh, I would say, consider to add to your uh, way of working. Some of them might be very useful. Some of them might be less useful for you. So it really depends on what you're developing and what kind of risk uh, profile that you're working on. Now, if we blow that up uh, and blow that up even bigger uh, uh, towards you, then you see that in these five business functions, the governance, the implementation, and so on, you have the security practices and each of the security practices has to or have what we call two streams. These are activities, like uh, for instance, if you look at security testing here at the bottom uh, right, you have a scalable baseline. And so like adding like automation and testing uh, to your, to your uh, CI CD pipeline. Uh, and for instance, also deep understanding. So this is manual testing uh, for to look for security issues in your, in your code. Um, and so you see that each of the security practices is built of, out of two streams. Um, then if we, so for each of these activities, we have a clear objective. What do we want to get out of that? What's the benefit of doing that? A description, obviously, of, uh, of that activity. Yeah? For instance, like security testing, what is it? Uh, there's pen testing in there with a clear description. And also question, a question about, okay, how do you, are you doing this? Because later on, remember this is a maturity model, you need to be able to see, okay, are we doing this activity or not? Um, and something that came with 2.0, we also added quality criteria to make sure that uh, indeed you're verifying the correct uh, maturity level of your activity. If you do a deep dive on security practice uh, uh, structure here, uh, in this case, the control verification and the misuse abuse testing, uh, this is the part of the requirements driving the requirements driven testing. So this is part of the business function verification. So there's two streams in there. So how does this work? We have the maturity level. There's three maturity levels. Actually, there's four maturity levels in some. There's a zero, zero. You're not doing it, which is which can be uh, valid, but in most of the cases, you should be doing something. In this case, like requirements driven testing, uh, your your software has to have like probably some security building and you have to have an idea somewhere, okay, what kind of security, that's the requirements part. And that's actually another security practice that can drive this. And there's then the three levels. So level one is more like the very ad hoc activity of, uh, of verifying your security requirements in a way that they're implemented in your software. Level two is that you're 
uh, doing this in a more structured way, uh, you're also tying it really to the kind of software and the requirements that are important for your software. And so, and that's in general also the level two maturity uh, of, of the other security practices as well. And level three is that actually you have a feedback loop and that you learn from what you're doing. And that's the highest level of maturity. Uh, typically, there is also links and ties to other parts in the model. Um, and let me also be clear, in most of the cases, uh, a lot of organizations don't need to get to a level three. Uh, it, it might be that for you, level one is more than enough uh, to, uh, for your, your piece of software, or your functionality in terms of what you're doing, and that's enough. Depending on the kind of software you're building, uh, if, if it's a piece of software that controls a nuclear reactor, yeah, probably nine, might need to get to a level two or three. Uh, if it's to order software, it, if it's software to order lunches, uh, to order sandwiches over lunch for your colleagues uh, and you're only using it internally, Okay, you see that the risk profile is much much lower. So, and that's really where you will have to adapt the level of maturity towards the risk profile of your software. So that's the maturity, and we're going to measure always the maturity level of your security practices. Now, what we see here is we have the two streams. In this case, security requirements driven or requirements driven testing. There's two streams in there. There's a more what we call like positive stream, like we verify the security controls that we've built in, like are we actually doing authentication and so on. Uh, there, whereas there's a second stream that's more like the misuse abuse testing, that's more focused like on fuzzing, uh, doing abuse case testing and so on. Um, we're not going to explain in detail how the security practice works here. There's a full one or two day training if you want to, I would say do that. Um, but that's the structure. You have two streams and then each of these streams have the activities in there uh, that are described with their own objective and their own related question to that specific activity in that security practice stream. So that's actually how the overall structure of a security practice works. And if you understand this, you understand the model. And because the model really is built out of these 15 uh, different security practices and each of them have these obviously three levels, the streams and the activities explained. Anything else I've missed here, John? Well, there's just one detail I wanted to pick up on as, as you were talking about, and you know, we've talked a couple of times about for your organization, your target may not be level three in a given stream or within a given practice. One of the wonderful things about working with Sam is that it gives you these activities to talk about and when I'm doing a, a guided assessment with an organization, I'm saying in each of these activities, how are you doing this now? What, what do you have in place? And then really there's the question, is what you're doing in your opinion, good enough to meet your needs? So that even when you decide we're not going to implement that activity, we're not gonna worry about in particular, say one of these level three activities, You've made that intentional decision, having thought about your current state and what you really need, rather than it simply being a sin of omission that we just never really thought about it, so we're not doing it. And even that is a big value add for an organization to have made the conscious decision and to have that their reasoning captured. Exactly. All right. Yeah, thank you. So... I also uh, already mentioned questions, uh, so I'll show you how that uh, how we can find back those questions. So here we see an, an, there's an assessment toolbox. Uh, toolbox is a, like a, a nice name for actually a spreadsheet. We also now have now a uh, an application for that, which will John will show as well. Um, but so for each level and each activity, there's a certain question and there's quality criteria that, uh, that support those questions. And there's also, like I said, uh, I'll, I'll demonstrate this, the, the toolbox uh, just after the presentation, but there's also an, a, a web app, uh, a single page web app, but John can explain how it, what, it, what it's about. Okay, sure. So my team, and as was Lars mentioned when I was introduced, I'm, I'm at Datacom New Zealand. And then within the organization, I'm actually in the application security services team. So we do 
internally we help our teams make sure that they've got these practices in place and then externally i lead the software assurance practice and we do a lot of sam assessments now one of the things that i have always wanted for us to, to have is the ability to move away from an excel workbook and to a web-based tool that would let us do assessments on our browser and then within an organization to pull those assessments into a central repository, be able to look at them, look at them on a dashboard and, and then also look at assessments over time. Well, the first piece of that is to get a UI. And I was able to get some release time within my team to put together a minimum viable product of a single page application UI for entering an assessment. This is no more functionally than one of the tabs in the Excel workbook currently, but it's there as a starting point to try and get to some of these um, more broad enterprise features. So toward the end of our session, I'll go through a brief demo of, of what the app currently is and does. All right, great. And, and thanks for that. Um, so it, we typically start with, with the assessment. So there's a quick start guide. There's a quick start guide also I'll go through that over the website. But typically, uh, the assessment is not the goal. Uh, the goal is to reach or to improve um, your overall maturity over a certain, a certain couple of points. So you set a target, you define a plan, you implement and roll it out. I'll show you uh, in a couple of minutes on the website where there's more detail to actually do that. So there's guidance there as well. Where can we all find this? Uh, everything in terms of documents, uh, presentations, trainings, we have a shared Google Drive. Everything in terms of projects, um, I would say, uh, underpinning materials uh, are in GitHub. And actually also the website is a, is a GitHub uh, website built actually uh, automatically from every change that we do on the model, uh, it will generate the, the, the website and everything else. Uh, and obviously the, the website itself. Now, it's, uh, it's something that actually helped us a lot to generate the, or to create the updated version of some, and also to create, I would say, follow-up releases, because we're not only at 2.0, we're at actually at 2.0.4. Every time we see a typo or we need to fix something, for instance, there was a small bug in the Excel spreadsheet, we can now push that uh, through the GitHub uh, and then release that uh, through uh, small releases um, uh, from, from the GitHub towards the different uh, channels, the, the website, the toolbox, the applications, and so on. Uh, so I'll show that later on. There's a whole, I, mean, I have our own DevOps, uh, I would say, uh, cycle. It's like we're not releasing every day, that's not, but we have our own uh, CI, CD pipeline. Under, underpinning the framework, these are all YAML files. If you do change there, it's pushed uh, and it's pushed in the GitHub and committed. There is a verification in terms of formatting. The markdown is being generated to push towards the website. It's being built and deployed then also towards the website as well. So it's something to, uh, that, that helps us a lot, a lot to iterate or update the model much faster than in the past. Also, we are working on translating the website itself uh, and the model itself to different languages. Uh, so there's different translations ongoing. Uh, we're using the crowding platform for that. And if you're watching this and you're um, and you're and you speak one of these languages, or you want to have the sound translated in one of your own languages in your own organization or your own country feel free to reach out to us. We're more than happy uh, to facilitate that. Once we have a full translation of the model, we'll also make the website uh, multi-language so that you can toggle between the different languages. I also pointed out a little bit, we have, uh, a we have full training slides, but you also have a train the trainer package. So if within your organization, you have multiple people or multiple teams, uh, that you want to have trained on this. Um, also feel free to reach out to their to us is there as well. Uh, I'll point you in the Google Drive to the materials. Um, and last but not least, so once you're starting to uh, to work on some yourself, 
you'll also have probably the question coming up like, okay, that's all good and fine. We know where we are, we know where we want to get, but how do I compare to others? How do I compare to my peers? Uh, and that's the sum benchmark track. And uh, Brian Glass, who, um, who is all, all, he's already with us for, uh, I would say, the most part of the project, um, has quite some experience with uh, with that that kind of, that kind of task. He has been involved in the OWASP top ten also to gather all those data points. Um, and so he's working on the first MVP of a sum benchmark. Now for that sum benchmark, actually, where we'll be able to compare ourselves to. Uh, I would say a, a minimal data set of other measurements for, for, for other organizations, we need to bootstrap that. So if you have, uh, and if you can have uh, your, uh, uh, or you can share your own data set, please reach out to Brian. Uh, at this stage, he is uh, accepting data sets uh, by email, uh, but obviously once we have a minimal critical uh, amount of data sets, uh, they will be pushed in towards the, the benchmark uh, repository, obviously in an anonymized way, but then we can start to compare ourselves to the benchmark data sets. These uh, contact details are here. Um, and that's also, I would say, a common uh, request for, for input and feedback. Uh, we have a core project team that's working on the, on the project itself. Um, but uh, we count and we use and we um, and we really call upon community feedback. So every time you have you find the possible improvement or a bug or something you want to add or in terms of guidance, uh, you're much uh, much welcome to share that with us through the different channels that uh, that we have and we take that into account as well. Um, what we're working on in the next couple of uh, months uh, is uh, adding uh, OWASP uh, references uh, to the different parts of the model, uh, adding more uh, on like an online version of the of this assessment tool, hopefully also integrated with that uh, benchmark data. Um, also count on mapping some of the, I would say, activities on security controls that are typically part of regulations and so on. Also, each year we organize some user summits. We're probably going to use do one uh, this fall or autumn uh, together with the San Francisco Global AppSec. So those are the plans for the future. Um, with that, uh, so we have a Slack channel. We have our GitHub uh, page. That's, those are the ones really where we uh, can capture that. And let me also push towards, so if you want to get updates, there's a newsletter. We've not done this al alone. And besides John and, uh, and myself, we have lots of other people from other parts in the world uh, that have contributed to this. This is a core team, but it's also other volunteers as well. Very grateful also for the nations of our sponsors. And if you want to sponsor us, uh, obviously you're more than welcome to do that. Uh, and with that, let me go to the website itself. So the best part to start is owasp.owaspsum.org and there you'll end up on, uh, on this uh, home page. Now, here you'll find the, the different steps typically that you can uh, do. So getting started, doing an assessment, compare yourself with the benchmark, but also you'll find the model. And so the bundle itself is here. Uh, here you can see the full model. You have five business functions. Uh, for instance, here, if you look at the governance, education, guidance, uh, you have the different streams. So there's three training and awareness, there's a stream organization and culture. And if you go through that, uh, you can see the different maturity levels of and the activities in that. So maturity level one, education, guidance, basic awareness training, uh, role-based training on level two, uh, having a security knowledge uh, overall and a formal training program and, and so on is level three. So that's actually how you can browse through the model itself. Now, how do you do that? Uh, and how do you start that? Uh, like I said in the beginning, uh, if you go to the homepage, the getting started is actually where you should get started if you're new to uh, some. 
Uh, and here you have at the bottom the, the, the different steps that I pointed out. So you have to prepare yourself. Uh, so there's different activities, resources there. You can assess where you are, you set your targets and so on. So the different steps are explained in here. So that's, I would say, the, the most important parts of the, of the website itself um, on how to do that. The model, there's guidance here as well, especially, so for instance, also on, on Agile, uh, if you want. Uh, we have a couple of community-related pages where one of the most important ones is the frequently asked questions. Uh, so if you have a certain question uh, and that you think it should be on there, feel free to share that as, as, as well. Now, the best way to reach out to us is through Slack. And here's a direct link to the Slack channel. If you're not on the OWASP Slack workspace yet, there is a uh, link in here to actually uh, get an invitation. Uh, so uh, uh, once this will load, you can fill in your email address, you get an invite, you'll get inv invited to the Slack uh, workspace. And there actually, there's project dash some obviously immediately start that uh, in your slack workspace then you'll be it will be easier for you to find it back um, but here actually is where i would say the most part of our community is active uh, and where if you have any questions uh, you can pose them here and there's much much interaction not only that uh, if you go here at the top of that slack channel you have four pinned URLs. So you have obviously you have the website, but you also have the GitHub page where we have the different uh, underlying uh, repositories. And we have the core repository with all the YAML files. And anytime you change something there, it's, uh, it's pushed uh, towards the website. Here you can also find back the latest release. Uh, actually, we're on 2.0.4. And actually here, and I'll show you later on, you can also download the latest uh, toolbox or spreadsheet. With that, you also have the Google Drive, which is on the top uh, part here. And the Google Drive, this is a shared Google Drive where you find all presentations, uh, past uh, repository of user days, uh, some uh, summits, mappings, the roadmap, and so on. So, also some training here as well. So we did recently did some trainings, but we also have a train the trainer package also available here. So you're much, uh, if you want to do that uh, within your organization, obviously feel free to do that, but make sure to read the readme first, uh, which is in here. And then last but not least, um, and we'll probably hopefully also be adding this uh, recording to our YouTube channel as well, but we do have a WASPTOM YouTube channel with past recordings and sessions. So make sure you subscribe to that and hit the bell that you get like a notification whenever we release something new. So that's actually how uh, I would say the overall set of documents uh, and features and uh, tools are available. Now, as a last part of what I wanted to show, and then I'll give the word to John, the sum assessment itself, how do you do that? There's different ways to do that, but here is a link to a self-assessment Microsoft Excel toolbox. This is actually the one that you should be downloading. This is pointing to the latest release in, uh, in, uh, in the GitHub. And once you download that, you'll have downloaded the toolbox or this Excel spreadsheet. Now it has like a, a front page, and then there's a couple of tabs in there. There's the interview tab, scorecard, roadmap, and roadmap chart. And how does it work? If you, for instance, go to education and guidance, uh, do, your, do your employees or your staff members, do they have like uh, training? Well, maybe at least half of them. Um, is the training customized? Here, this is linked to the second activity, measured letter two um, activity. Well, maybe for some. Do you have a learning management system? And do you track employee training or certification? Well, maybe you don't. Well, that's not obviously not bad, uh, no worries. So once you fill this in, you see that there's a rating popping up here. Actually, this is our maturity level. The maturity level of the first stream of education and guidance. Uh, so if we also fill in organization and culture, for instance, 
you have security champions for at least half of your teams and you have a software software security center of excellence for the entire organization uh, maybe like imagine that and we started implementing a centralized portal then you filled in the security practice of education and guidance and you know that you're at the maturity of 1.25 out of a maximum of three that's actually how you do your assessment and that's the i would say through that uh, through that spreadsheet there's also a scorecard where you can then uh, look at how that reflects obviously we've only filled in one um, uh, I would say score, uh, one security practice, so there's not much going on there. But here in the roadmap, you can also start working on improving that in later cycles. And once you have do that, you've done that, you've also have your roadmap chart that's going to change. So but that's in a nutshell how that toolbox works. Um, obviously, much more information <clears throat> available about trainings. Or if you want to figure out uh, or more details, John is one of our next community calls. That's really what I wanted to uh, show, uh, and I think uh, let's uh, hand it over to John. John, you go. So a couple of comments before yeah. I jump over to sharing my screen um, on the the Excel workbook, and you notice the roadmap. Basically, it just uh, go to the the roadmap tab. I guess was the thing I was thinking about. Um, by default, you'll see that there's a phase one, phase two, phase three, phase four. And the way that the workbook is set up is that unless you change something here, the assumption is that you're mature, you're not going to change the way you're doing things and maturity will stay steady. So that just kind of shows you if we keep doing what we're doing, we'll stay at this level. That makes sense. If I decide, if you then decide we want to set up a phased roadmap. And you might decide the first phase is three months, the second phase is the next three months. You, you can set whatever timelines you want for these. And then you decide what you would like for your coverage to become by the end of that roadmap phase. And then you can see the conditional formatting is set up so that if you're targeting an improvement, it turns green. If you're predicting a reduction, it will actually turn red to show that you're you're actually planning or predicting a reduction in maturity and it allows you then to look and see how across the phases of of your roadmap where you've got improvements planned um, and one of the things that um, you saw was like the very first FAQ question was do I have to get to one out of one at level one before I start level two and I would say a pretty emphatic no if you're if you recognize your baseline is that we're at about half in the first activity in the level one activity and we're not really doing the level two activity then you could look at this as kind of a diffusion model and say we're going we want to get from in the level one activity we want to get from about half to almost everybody's doing it while at the same time introducing the level two activity to those who've already been doing the level one and that way you can have this kind of a, a wave as the more mature practices diffuse through the organization. Um, the other comment I wanted to make was about the train the trainer, which, of which I am somewhat proud. Um, so the idea is that we have a one day training class. And that class is intended to help people who are planning to run assessments understand how to do that. The train the trainer class is a two day session, which is intended to help people who intend to present the one day training, learn how to do that. So um, under the grant that Saba mentioned briefly, I developed and presented the train the trainer class and we made some improvements based on feedback we received and that's what's published there. But it is like the model itself. It's a growth stage. So if you're interested in starting to do assessments, the best thing to do would be to attend one of the classes. They're very often in conjunction with global OWASP conferences. When you get to the point where you would like to start training your own assessors, then you might take part in a train the trainer class in order for you then to be at the front of the room presenting the training. Okay, thank you for that. Now I'll go ahead and 
um, continue with sharing my screen briefly. Now, Samwise, as I mentioned when we introduced it briefly earlier, Samwise is not an extension beyond the Excel workbook. In fact, it has only a subset of its capabilities, but this is meant to be a starting point to get to having an application-based assessment system. On the homepage for the Samwise app, you can see that what you can do right now are enter responses for a single assessment, visualize your maturity results. So we've got some dynamic graphs that will let you see your maturity results for that single assessment. And then in the visualization page, we have the ability to import one previous assessment and do a side-by-side -side in the graphs. So that is, is, of course, less than you can do with the Excel workbook, but that was the minimum product we were able to put together before Datacom told us we needed to go do paying work instead. The intent here is to support the SAM project, which is mentioned. If you look at our about tab, it basically says, what, what are we looking at? And this is one of the things I wanna point out. What we would really like to do is enhance the capabilities of the application to rival and even excel what you can do in the roadmap workbook to the ability of, to the point of being able to have multiple phase roadmaps and showing the progressive graphs the same as you see in the excel workbook to be able to obviously to do that do it as a look back you can do it as planning saying i just did an assessment i want to plan my future milestones you can also say i did an assessment today I would like to compare that with the assessments from three, six, and nine months ago. So instead of being able to compare with one, we'd love to be able to let you do multiple. And then this is where I think we'll really see the value as the two tracks come together is when we have the SAM benchmark data model done and there's a published API to allow you to access benchmark aggregate data, as well as submit benchmark data sets to be able to do that from within the application. So that once you've done an assessment, you can say, I would like to compare myself with the global benchmark for financial services companies. Pull that data set through the benchmark projects API and view that within the application. Similarly, what we would really like to get to is where you can complete an assessment, look through the visualization, say, yes, that is where we are today. I would like to contribute that to the benchmark and simply to click a button, which will de-identify your assessment containing only your metadata about your industry size, number of applications and so on, along with your responses and submit that to the review queue for the benchmark project. So our goal is to get to the point where all of that would be within the tool. Of course, we are not there today. What we have right now is the ability to go through the SAM interview questionnaire in a single page application. Now the application is written in JavaScript. It's based on SurveyJS. So you'll notice it looks an awful lot like say a SurveyMonkey survey they have similar roots. So all of that information you see and can enter in the interview tab of the Excel workbook is presented here. The question, and since um, Seba was talking about education and guidance, we can look at that one. So for the level one, the level one question, do you require employees to have SDLC training? If you'd like to review the qualifying criteria, you can expand that. You can see because it does take up a good bit of room, we make it so that that can be collapsed. And then you can select one of the four values and you can also type comments, which are in column, I wanna say I of the interview uh, spreadsheet tab. So we've given you the ability to complete an interview here in, this app. 
right now, as a very intentional um, step, we've decided that everything is run locally. So this you can see is actually running locally. I just started it up as it's an NPM app. I just started it. We have not yet, but we intend to host um, the ability to go to a URL on the OWASP SAM website and start the app. But all that that will really do is download the JavaScript so you can run it locally. And the only option that you have for saving right now is to save your responses to your local file system in a JSON file. So your responses do not go anywhere other than your local system. In the future, as I talked about you know, the bigger vision for this application, we would like to follow the model that actually Threat Dragon does, one of the other OWASP projects. So you can go to an enterprise site somewhere on your intranet, start the application, complete your responses, and when you save your responses, they will go into your organization's repository of assessments. Once they're in the repository, another objective will be to create a sister application that will let you have a benchmark and scorecards to look at which of your projects have done assessments, what was their baseline score, how are they progressing against their, their roadmap targets, and all of that can be looked at as a dashboard for the organization. So that's really where we'd like to see this go. And this initial application gets us that core engine. As I go through the questions, I make some choices, and I'm not going to go through all 90 of them. But let's say, just for this practice, and for a couple of the others, I'll go ahead and make some arbitrary selections. And it would help if I did not lose track of where I was. So I've done strategy metrics, portions of strategy. There we go. I knew I still had more to do. Live demos. So rather than go through the entire assessment, I've just filled out the answers for a single business function. If I then go to results, I will see a summary of the responses I have submitted. So of the 18 responses I gave, I had two no's, six partials, five at least haves, and five yes for alls. And then that worked out to be a maturity for the entire business function of 1.5 out of three. And then I can see for my individual practices, that I got to 1.75 on two of them and 1.0 out of three on the third. We have the radar chart, the spider graph, so that you can see right away as you start to pull these, pull together your assessment responses, you can come here and dynamically check and see, oh, well, how does that look? And as you, you can go back and forth between the assessment and the visualization. When you're done, you can say, yep, I wanna save my responses. And then the second option I have is that I can say, I want to select another one JSON file against which I would like to compare this. Since this visualization is very useful and these images might be something you'd wanna pull into a report, we've added the export graphs function. So it will generate a PDF with the graphs as you see them just sequentially in the document. That allows you to capture those and then you can grab the images out and use them in other documents as you wish. That is where we are. And I see I pretty much hit time. We are at 10 till the hour. Yes. All right. Thank you, John, indeed. And I'll, I'll also uh, continue sharing my screen again. So it's, uh, it's time for Q&A. Just, just before that, I just also wanted to point out where you can you find uh, OWASP SAM? Obviously on our GitHub, 
and there it's one of the repositories samwise right here so if you want to start it out right here then that's where you find the latest and greatest version of samwise so with that we'll open the floor for uh, q a all right thanks for the session john and siwa uh, we have a couple of questions in the q a um, the question the class yesterday was cancelled when will the next tra training session uh, be available for the uh, the train the trainer that is I most most probably uh, it will take place as part of the next global AppSec in San Francisco. Uh, now that will be an in person uh, I would say conference. So I'm assuming also that the training will be in person at that point in time. Um, with that said. Um, from time to time, we also get questions from other organizations to do uh, a training. For instance, I did one a couple of months ago in Finland, uh, where we were invited by the Isaka and the OWASP chapters there locally. So if you have uh, a group of 10 people or more that you think would uh, benefit from having a training, either remote or on site, reach out to us and we'll, uh, we'll make it happen. All right. I apologize, Seba. Was the the class that was scheduled was that the one day or the train the trainer? This uh, the so typically we schedule the one day trainings, uh, and so it was uh, scheduled for for a global upset Dublin here, but unfortunately there were not enough uh, registrations uh, for the training to uh, to continue. So if you're but, looking for a a subtropical winter vacation. The next offering will actually be in three weeks in Auckland, New Zealand at the OWASP New Zealand Day Conference. Exactly. Uh, now the, com the conference will be live streamed and you're welcome to register for that. I should have plugged it more, um, but the training is actually face to face. Yeah. All right. Cool. Thanks for the answers. Another question. Um, if we are building an AppSec program into a new team, is Sam a good place to start? With a, you mean with a new team, is Sam a good place to start? Uh, yes, of course, it's, it's a good way to start, uh, but make sure that uh, Sam is not, I would say, the goal. It's your tool and your framework to improve your activities. Um, so, and there's definitely a couple of like really basic foundational activities in some that will uh, that will kickstart uh, your uh, your roadmap um, one example of them being the education guidance but there's others in there as well the threat modeling part the testing part um, making sure that you have a good build and deployment um, uh, system in place that you have uh, the plugins for uh, adding uh, tools to that uh, to those ci cd pipelines so there's definitely a couple of, uh, I would say, foundational activities in there that uh, that for a new team would be recommended. Um, a, I guess a slightly different take on the answer. Um, I'll go ahead and assume that you're talking about an organization that is doing things, has built products, is selling software, but hasn't stood up a team before. In that situation, and this is actually a place where I've used Sam, it's a great way to take stock of the good things that are going on and to make a conscious decision to adopt some of them as the organization's standard. So if you think we would really like for there to be a consistent threat modeling practice across the organization, and in the process of doing a SAM assessment, you learn that one team has been doing threat modeling and they've got some really great threat models, they've got good scripts, they have a nice cadence for doing it, adopt it. <laughs> and then when you get to that level two and say, do we have a consistent process? Yes, we do. We took that one and applied it to the whole organization. Indeed. So, in that, so John answered it for a question where you have like already an organization and other practices. I assumed like a greenfield, like totally new startup. So, but you can use some in both situations. All right, cool. Thanks for that. Um, a question I have, um, what are some of, of the common pitfalls you see when, when organization adopts them? Uh, 
Uh, I would say to be uh, probably too ambitious uh, in in uh, in applying the whole framework to to everything at the same time. Um, I would say one of the best practices to start small with one or two teams uh, that typically maybe represent the rest of the organization um, and go for what we call like the, the very basic adoption of some. Uh, like what are you doing? How? What kind of like easy steps can we add to to your practice and start uh, tracking that with some and demonstrating how some can be helpful for your organization and from there build out your uh, your your practice towards the different other teams so but starting off like with a full implementation for everything at the same time that's uh, it's going to be hurtful um, <clears throat> uh, one other one that i see quite a bit is too much of a focus on the raw score and and really it's a misunderstanding of the purpose of the tool but it's important and it can be a, a stumbling block right out of the gate. If you aren't able to communicate to everyone that there are no repercussions for having a current score that's not great, that we are not using this as a way to decide which teams are better than others and that you'll somehow be punished later. It has to be very clearly communicated that we want to understand where our gaps are so that we can work toward improving and to make it very clear that what the most important thing the most valuable output from our engagement with a team is we want honest input and so i very often will get involved in an organization i'll say well can't we go ahead and count this sort of thing we're doing so we can get a better score the score doesn't matter and overcoming that and then as as Sable alluded to the other flip side of thinking that we have got to get to 3.0 anything less is a failure that is also not true so it's these I see those as big pitfalls of, of not really understanding the right way to think about a SAM maturity score and targets. Hey, that's very insightful feedback, I would say, as I think a lot of organizations are aiming for uh, for the highest score immediately. I want to, I want to be at three, um, but start low and be honest with yourself as a as a team or a squad. Now, if you want to, if you want to have as an internal metric how close you are coming to your target score as a measure of progress, that's useful. But your target score is probably not going to be a three. Typically, I've seen a, a target aggregate being around a 2.2. All right, cool. Thanks, uh, John. Um, maybe one final question. Um, I see there are a lot of possibilities to, to contribute to the SAM, like for example, via, via crowding, via um, data sets, via um, yeah, all other things. Um, any uh, additions to that? Like for example, can contributors help on the, uh, on the SAM WISE application? Oh yes, please. Oh yes. <laughs> you are more you're more than welcome uh, to indeed uh, to help us help us out. Uh, some has become quite a quite a big project. Lots of things uh, in motion. Um, I think especially now we're working with uh, on the benchmark. So so Brian can definitely help, use some help there. Um, with, uh, with the MVP implementation, there's there's lots of stuff already going. So the best page to actually go through is the OWASP SUM uh, our community contributing page. We, we do get this question a lot. So the, here's different pointers what you, to what you can do uh, and how you can reach out uh, to us. Uh, and then I would say the best way to also uh, contribute is to reach out uh, to us on the Slack channel. Uh, and there will uh, will put you in contact with uh, different people within the core team to uh, get you started. 
All right, cool. You heard it's the WASP community. <laughs> okay, mm -hmm. I think it's it's fine to wrap up. I want to thank you, Siba, John, for the uh, the info, insightful session. Um, and then in about 30 seconds, we'll head over to the right. next session, which is about uh, abusing Kubernetes. All right. All right. Go thank you. Thank you, Lars. Thank you, yeah. everyone who's listening. Thank you, Lars. Thank you, John. Bye, everybody.